Welcome to part two of the oak cupboard door build. We've made the frame in part one. We've just been and test fitted it. It's not very far away where it's being fitted. So I've uh, tested it in the opening. It's pretty much perfect. So we're good to move on to making the door. So I planed the door styles up a little while ago when I was planing up the timber for the frame and just let them to sit. We've seen a, a tiny bit of movement in them. If you remember, we did a, like a grain match against the styles to the jams of the frame. I've been a bit lucky in that the, the movement has been seen in the hinge style, so the hinges will help to counteract that slight bow in the timber. And the style of the door that we're going to use as, as the latch side or the, the swinging side has actually stayed pretty straight. I'm quite lucky in that respect that I've got a nice straight piece of timber on that unsupported side. So you need a bit of luck every now and then. We'll move on to setting out the mortises for the styles. If you remember, we marked the position of where the grain lined up against their jams um, because they're from the same piece of timber. So we're going to use that reference point to start the setting out from. Right, so if you remember, we've put a face and an edge mark on the door styles. So we've already orientated them in the door. These are the two marks for the bottom of my frame. So they're the inside measurement for the bottom of the frame. So I'm just going to align them two marks up with the pairs facing each other and then clamp them together. I'll clamp the other end as well. Now it's a pretty simple set out process for the door. I'm going to take the height measurement from the frame that we've got. I'm going to take it as a tight measurement. So we've got 1606. We'll transfer that across to these door styles. Again, using the 100 mils on the end of the tape, we're going 1606. That's 1706. Please don't forget your 100 mils. And once we've got that measurement, it's just a case of putting the timber sizes into the frame within it. So we've got a 60mm top and bottom rail. Sixty top. We'll have a 10 mil deep groove for the panel. So because the mortise is it within the groove and it's 10 mil deep, we need to set our mortise back 10 mil. And then we're going to have a, a little wedge tenon in there, so you could split that in half. Bear in mind you're going to lose a couple of mil off for a door fit gap. 45 mil. I'd probably probably put a, a 20 a 20 mil tenon. And by the time you've got sort of four mil as a wedge, you're about halfway on the on the back edge. So 20 mil of tenon on that one. And we'll square those lines over. So if you've been paying attention and learning your way through setting out, you should know what them three or four lines mean now. So this is your haunch, that's your mortise, and then this is your setback. So your mortise through, right through the piece of timber, and your haunch is like a stub uh, mortise, basically. We'll do the same at the other end. So 60 mil. 10 mil groove, and then we've got 20 mil of tenon. So again, haunch, mortise, setback. Right now we need to set the intermediate rails. We've got two rails and three equal panels. So an equal panel on a tech drawing will quite often be just showing with two sort of like an equal sign on its on its side. So that means we've got equal distance panels to go within. So the easiest way to set that out is to draw these pieces of timber on. So you want to draw the sight line of the timber on. So because we've got a moulding, it's to the to the point on the moulding here. So that point there, to that point there. So it's the, the widest part of the timber before you start machining. So, when we machined the timber up, we got them rails for the doors out at 70 mil, so that this flat in the middle, after you've put the two moulds on, is the same as it is on the door styles and the rails, so it looks aesthetically the same. So 
they're slightly wider than these top rails so we've marked 270 mils onto one end of this door style. 140, I'll just check that actually because they might have finished slightly less. You can of course just use the rails themselves for a measurement. Yeah, they were uh, 60, 69 I think. 68 well, so we didn't quite get the thickness out of them. So let's mark them on to at 68. So 68, that's 136. So from that 136 mark there, we need to measure to the top of the other rail or the bottom of the top rail. So the gap between the rails that's left. So effectively we've marked that rail and that rail just to one end. And the gap that's left between there and there is the gap of all three panels that you're going to see. So again, working from 100mm from the inside of that rail at the bottom. So we've got 1349. 1349. We want to divide that by three. Use the calculator to save any confusion. So we've got 449.6 repairing. So if we just measure now from each end from them rails, that measurement, 449.6. So we want 549.6, remember your 100 mil. Dead easy to forget it. Then we mark a 68 mil rail on there. Then do the same from the other end. So we've got 549.6. We want a 68mm rail again, nice sharp pencil lines if you can. And if we just double check that measurement, so from there to there should be exactly the same, so 449.6, which is perfect. So once we've got them outside lines set out, we can do the same as the other tenons and mark up our tenon positions on. So again, we've got 10 mil of the setback, so I don't move the tape for this, I work from the numbers, so I'm going off 110 there and 58, so there's less room for error. And that tenon there is 48 mil long. I forget what the max tenon width is, is it five times the, the length of the tenon? I wouldn't go much more than that for a 12 mil tenon. Yeah, four times would probably be as, as much as I'd go in terms of if you've got a 12 mil wide tenon, I'd only go four times as long in an actual tenon itself before you broke it into two separate tenons. So at 48 mil, we're about right there. It's perfect in fact. So again, mark the positions out again, 58 and 11, and that's our mortise set. We can then square them lines over. So setback, setback, mortise, and that's going right through. There'll be a nice strong joint there. And that's the style set out. That's as much as we need to do. We're just going to square those like mortise lines over the face. So face mark, and we'll square all of them across. You don't knock your square out of square first. And again, on this back edge where the wedge side of the tenon is, we're squaring those two lines over. So that's the through mortise, and we're also going to add in our wedge room mark. So again, you can measure this if you wish, tenon like that. Probably go four to five mil on the measurement. It's four look like, it's not a lot is it? I'd go five mil. but generally I'd just eyeball them as you're setting out, unless you want really, really precision same width wedges. You can measure them. Intermediate rails equal either side because you can hammer them in at the same time to get an equal wedge room depth so the wedges look the same when it's finished. You might have heard me say on the window video, if you've watched that one, you can reduce this wedge room very slightly over this one or increase this one towards the inside because 
when you cut this tenon joint here and you actually physically cut that tenon away, you want a tiny bit of wiggle room to get the joint in and out. So that creates a bit of a, a void on the back of the tenon that this wedge will take up. So quite often you'll see if you, if you mortise them two wedge rooms in the same width, you'll end up with a bigger wedge room there than you end up with here. So you can just reduce that back wedge room very slightly. Something like this, I'd just eyeball it as a reminder to do the wedge more than a strict line and just punch them in quickly while you're mortising. Comes a bit of a feel thing after, after a while and you, you know, your lines are a bit of a, a guide for your wedges. Same on the other one. Squaring off the end of a, a piece of timber that way just make sure there's no step in it from your planing or it's not tapered off where it's not quite held up with planing and your squares canting over a bit and not producing a square line. It's, it's always better practice to work from this side unless you know your timber's sort of absolutely dead flat along that edge. That's the door styles set out, so we'll move on to tenoning the rails and setting them out too. Here I've got the top and the intermediate rails and the bottom rail. I'll just have a look around these and mark out any imperfections and designate a face and edge mark. So that's going to be my face and edge of that one and that's going to be the bottom rail. This is going to be then the top rail and a bit of a, a shake on the back here. So we'll put that on the back side so this will be the face and I will put that towards the top of the door so we'll have it this way around and I might swap that for a bottom to make that the top rail less likely to see it down on the floor than you are up on the top of the door I've just tried a bit of stain on this bit here it's having a like a walnut spirit stain and then waxed finish this door. There's a bit of a black staining sit on this side in the oak, but it's not going to show up too bad through that spirit stain. And by the time we've got a tenon in there too, we should lose most of it. So just checking to see what that came through like. That should go out when we sand it and then reapply the stain. So it's going to be my face of the intermediate rail. We want a double edge mark on this one, so we need to machine both edges of this piece. And same again on this one. So we've got a bit of yellow stain in there, and some nice little pin knots on this side, so we'll keep this as the face. And there are two edge marks, like so. So I'm just going to set out on the bottom rail the Muntin mortise, so this mortise here, and then just transfer it all the way up through the door, because it's on every single piece. All that's going to be is the width of the muntin, so that's 68 millimetres. I'll mark that off one end, my eyes will let me. And then take that measurement, which is 544, divide it by 2, which is 250, 70, 272. Just check that. 68 mil. And that's our centre, so that's the muntin centred on that rail. We'll mark our setbacks in for the mortise. So we've got 68 mil, so it'll be 10, and then 58. For them 10 mil setbacks, and we'll square that over. We only need to square this over on that inside edge, not right through, because it's not having a through tenon. We only need to square the mortise line over. So now we've got our setting out, we can just use that rail to set all the others out. If you've got an offset muntin, so one side's bigger than the other, you just want to label these rails in their orientation now, how you want them. Go like that. 
you'll have a top to that rail where you can see it. Bear in mind you're going to machine this moulding away here, so don't mark it there. So top, and then that's the bottom, top, and then that's the bottom. You can also mark, if you know which side your hinges are going, that will be the hinge side on this end of the rails, and that's just going to keep the that mortise in the right position if it's offset. It's good practice to do it, even if it's not, so that if your marking is just a tiny bit out, you don't get a wobble if you look at the centre of your door through them mud and tin rails. You can square them across on each rail, so we're nice and flush at the ends. You can do all the lines if you wish, but the only ones that really matter are those mortise lines. And then the same for the top rail. That's all the setting out for the rails. We'll tenon first, set the mortiser up, then we'll mortise them through. Depth wise for the stub mortise here, I'd go sort of around half of what timber's left after you've machined your groove. So we've got a 10mm deep groove. So that leaves 50 mil, so then we'll go another 25. So we're looking to turn and add in somewhere around 25 from the back edge. So it'll be a uh, 35 mil deep mortise into there. Unless you can clean the bottom of the hole out absolutely perfectly, you're gonna have to go just a touch deeper. If you've got a 35 mil tenon, probably gonna go about 36, 37 mil with the mortise chisel. These ones can be done right through and them tenons can meet in the middle. If you're really fancy, you can do stub tenons in all of them and then have an accurately cut bottom to the mortise and you can have a hidden wedge in that tenon. So as you slide that tenon in, it's nice and tight in the mortise. And then you have a cut, a, a pre-cut slot in the end of your tenon with a, a drill hole at the end of it. And you get a, a little wedge out that's just a bit too long for a tight fit. And when you clamp your door together, those wedges actually lock that tenon into that mortise using them sort of split holes to allow them that tenon to move open or split open without physically splitting the piece of timber. So it sort of locks it in place. The theory is it locks it in place without splitting it. It's, it's, you've got to be dead accurate if you're doing that. They don't want to be too tight and I've never really seen a need for it too much. It's, I've never done them really in anger and never seen a, a need for them. All my doors that I've ever made are, are still holding together because in theory, your top and your bottom rail are wedged up tight and all these are, are through tenon and they can't go anywhere. So the material in between here, in theory, shouldn't be able to go anywhere either. So as long as you've got a, a good fit tenon and plenty of glue in there, it shouldn't, in theory, move anywhere. Moving on to the muntings themselves. To get the length of them, we've got to go back to our door styles. So we've got this sight line gap. If there's no panel there, the sight line gap between the intermediate rails in the middle and the intermediate rails in the top and bottom rail. All the same length, which makes it nice and easy to set out. But we're looking at taking that measurement. So that sight line there, I think it was 449 point something. 449.6, I've got it down here, look. So we're looking at that measurement there. If we're gonna use the, the same setup on the tenoner to do these, so the same length tenon and then trim them down afterwards, we need to cut it off at that measurement there, plus the thickness of the styles on each end of the tenon. So that tenon will be a 60 mil tenon. So we need 120 mil on the length of this piece of timber here, extra from that sight line size to push them through the machine at the same size. You can, if you've not got, if you've only got plus 30 mil of timber out, you can just adjust your tenoner to do a little 30 mil stub tenon and it'll save you cutting them off as well to length. But I like to just do everything all in, in one setting. So I'll, I'll take that measurement there and add the 60 mil on both ends if we've got the, the timber available and just push them all through at the same time. So I'll cut them off to length on the crosscut now at 449.6 plus 120 mil. All we've got to do on the buntings is put a face mark on for our best face. How we want them to orientate in the door and that's everything before we need to tenon them. 
to set the tenoner up, I'm just going to set that door style out over the rail. So it's a 60 mil width style. The pencil's gone a bit crook. And then we're going to have to look at our sample piece that I've got on here. So I've already got a sample of the mould that I'm going to use out. If you're hand cutting tenons like this, you're going to need to do that to work out how much you're going to offset this moulding against the inside edge here. So this piece of timber, 70 mil. We need to offset it to get that exact shoulder length, 58.6. So that's 11.4 mil of offset. 58.4. So we've got 11.5 mil of offset. Slightly more than I've allowed on the rails, but by the time we shoot, the styles in the middle rails, the intermediate rails, should end up about the same size. Look at that again. Eleven and a half mil. So that's our a two shoulder depth. So on the back of the door, I'm going to have a square shoulder, and then on the front of the door, I we'll label that up as a face there. So on the back of the door here, that will be the shoulder. On the front of the door, this will be our shoulder, and we're going to ten and them square. I've set my gauge pins to a half inch chisel, and that just wants to be dead in the centre, so I'll, I'll mark a rough centre here with a pencil line. Sit that on, and just try it from uh, both sides gently. Oh, perfect, got that. Tighten up a bit. Just double check it, it's pretty good. And always gauge from your face, even if you're working in the centre. It's on a face, you can gauge them lines through. It doesn't matter on the pattern piece that you're running the lines through a bit longer than you need to. I'll just highlight them for you on the video with a pencil line. So we're taking that section off there for the face, and then this section off on the back side. And that will be our tenon. I'll just set the tenon up to that, we can run them through. And I've just set the mortiser up so that the tenon sits nicely flush and on the two faces there. It's the joy of doing the tenoning first is you can adjust that mortise position until you get that perfectly flat surface on the top of the, the joint there. So just set that up and now I can mortise all of my door styles. As I've said on the window making video, on the casement window video, gone a bit more in depth with the the jointing system between the tenon and the, the mortise so watch that if you if you want a bit more info on the the whole mortise and tenon system but we always mortise from the back edge first so where the wedges are is where we mortise first then we turn it over and mortise in from that inside edge to finish the cut on this machine I need to set the haunch depth first before I set the three mortise depth. So the three mortise depth, this curved part of the chisel has to reach at least halfway or just beyond. And then the haunch depth, we've got a 10 mil deep groove for the panel. So we've got to go beyond that to create a haunch. So I'm gonna go in about 20 mil. 
to somewhere there. That sets my haunch depth. And then I adjust that lever, and then that gives me my three mortise depth. So it's actually set pretty good. I'm just gonna raise it up. Touch on there and lock it off. Nice and tight on that Allen key because they've got a habit of moving. And then we can mortise away. So we're doing three mortise on them in two lines, then a wedge room either side. And on the same setting on the mortiser, I'm going to do all the intermediate rails and the top and bottom rail too. So I'm just going to set these on a stub. I prefer a stub than a through on the intermediate rails because it will hold the glue captive. So when you push the two things together, you're not just going to push the glue out the other side of the joint. It's in a, a hollow or in a solid bottom mortise. So it tends to pressure around the joint a bit better. So I'm just going to stub them from both sides. And the same in the top and bottom rails, a stub tenon about half the depth of the material left, so that's about 25mm in this case. Once you've tenoned all the pieces, we can jump on the moulder and start to put the moulds on and the grooves for them, rails and styles. So I'm going to start with the groove. It's the biggest cut on the doors and it's the most likely to create any damage. So if we do that first, while there's still that bulk of square timber to cut against on the edge of the pieces of wood, and it's better than if you do the moulding first and get left with a really feather edge. Like it's just here, so we'll cut the groove first while there's still a square here to sort of hold the cut against. If you cut that mould in first, you've got that really fine edge, and then if you go to cut the groove afterwards, you're just going to end up breaking this bit of wood off here if there's any weak grain. So we'll do the groove first. I'm going to set up the Whitehill adjustable groover. This goes from 4 to 7 mil, and then it will do 8 to 14 mil. So I'm just going to Try it with this combination, Let's see what it comes out with, and then adjust it to suit. I've actually machined this groove in two stages. I've got quite a bit of figured grain in some of these pieces, so I decided a 10mm deep groove in one hit was a bit too much. I was going to create a bit of tear out on the, the corners of the cut, so I started with a 3mm deep cut and then I've done the full depth to 10mm in the next cut. I'm going home for the night now, so any door styles, especially in oak, sort of more exotic stuff that's prone to movement, just leave some clamps on them overnight. Put them so the, the two C-shaped springs that are in the styles oppose each other. 
these aren't too bad at all really there's about a two to three mil gap there so it's nothing at all on each style but just oppose them and then stick a clamp in the middle so that they're uh, they're clamped nice and straight and you know they're not left to just freely move in the ambient moisture of the workshop next job is to put the molding on so i've got a test piece here that I made up a panel just to mock it up and see if it looks right compared to the existing cupboard. So I'm going to replicate this on the spindle. I've written the bevel that I set the cutter to to get this exact moulding on the piece of wood. So I'm just going to put that cutter back in the machine, set that bevel and then we can adjust the height to suit and then push the fences back to get to this exact point. We're going to be checking the offset of the tenon, so the measurement difference between the two shoulders. So that's 60 and that's 48 and a half pretty much so that 11 and a half mil difference between them two is what we want on this piece of machine timber so we're talking about this difference here so the full thickness of that timber at 70 this measurement to that step there on the molding needs to be 11 and a half mil less when we've machined it sorry about the background noise i was a bit suspicious when my brother said he was going to go on the grinder for a bit Turns out it's just doing a bit of metal working. Because this is quite highly figured oak, it's really dry as well. I've just spent 10 minutes probably on the grinder on the Tormek. Been on the grinder as well. On the Tormek, it's really polishing these cutters up so they are dead sharp. You can shave with them, they're that sharp. And that's just going to help me get a nice clean cut and save too much sanding later on. So 95.3. Just to double check that the fit is correct, I mean I don't normally check with a sample like this but just to show you I've chopped back the moulding to this line here to suit a square shoulder and can just test fit any of the pieces into that section now that we've moulded it just to check that that joint fit is absolutely spot on. I've never had a problem doing it from measurements as long as your shoulders are all identically the same and you measure from the same point over that shoulder you shouldn't have a problem with, with doing it off the measurement. It's, it's definitely more accurate than, than setting it up just by eye on a test jig like that. You can have some inaccurate results if you get one that's not quite pushed through right. Whereas with measurements, if you work to a measurement from the start, it should in theory be perfectly correct on every piece. That's a beautiful joint. Now we can push all of them pieces through at that setting. Remember we're moulding every edge that's got that edge mark and we're doing the faces. Now we need to look at cutting the forge and the wedge room on the tenon. So this is the bottom joint here and the bottom rail. The tenon will sit in the mortise like this. So we need to chop this section out here down to that haunch depth that we set with the mortise chisel. So we're going to measure from the haunch depth in here to the shoulder of the tenon. And then we're also going to mark this through tenon position on this rail here. We know from the measurement what that is. Yeah, 20 mil. So we can mark 20 mil on this bottom rail. I normally do this in the vise with it sitting upright, but it's difficult to film it. And then we want to take a ruler and just measure from that haunch depth to the shoulder there, which in this case is exactly 24 mil. I've checked that on a few different door styles, just to double check that you've got a consistent haunch depth there. So that's quite critical to the joint going together. You can clean them up by hand to get a really nice flat bottomed hole if you want perfectly sharp joint <laughs> intersection between the haunch cut on the tenon and the mortise. From them two marks now, I can set up a combination square or a gauge. So I just normally, if it's just general bench joinery, set a combi square just shy of the line so that the pencil line is actually on the line. You can square that line over, so you can square your tenon down and run your haunch line in, all with the one tool. Bearing in mind you have to keep the inside edge to have the tenon. That's quite a common apprentice mistake is your tenon will end up here 
and you'll cut it out and then it's just after you finish cutting it out you realise you've cut the wrong side off and you've got no tenon left on your joint. Basically you're going to cut that waist away and that forms the basis of our wedged joint. Do that for all four tenons in the corners and if you've got wedged or split tenons in the intermediate rails then do that as well there. Doing loads of these, you can set up a bandsaw to cut that out. Nice sharp cut to the bandsaw. Decent handmade tenon saw is high on my next purchase list, so if you've got any suggestions, then drop us a message for what I should buy. Tin device, it's a bit easier, again, like that, and we've got a measurement of 20mm, or we can physically tick it against each tenon position and that's our waist. If you want to be super accurate you can set up a gauge for that haunch line so that you know that you're absolutely spot on with your haunch depths because like I say that is quite critical for the fit of the joint. So now we've got a joint that will go together into that three mortise. You can see it will sit down as far as this moulding here. That's our next job, is to scribe this joint. Our visible line of our joints when this is pushed tight up to this shoulder on this mortise here. So the tenon is engaged on that inside line, which is what it will be wedged up to there. So you'll fire this wedge in first, push it up to this flat line you've got here for it to sit against and then tighten it with this wedge. We know that this line here on this edge is our last visible point so if we transferred that over with a square like so we know from machining it's 11.5mm from this inside edge so it's 1.5mm from that 10mm setback. That is our last visible point so we can't cut anything out of this part past that section there. So I normally go about three or four mil beyond that to somewhere here, then make a cut in this section to remove that part of material away from there. I'd give it like three or four mil. If there's any movement in time, you will see that come through there. So if, it, if the joint loosens up, we're talking in lots of years times, not, not soon. That's where you'll see tiny gaps appear, just right in that corner of that joint there where they've been hand scribed. You can use a saw, gently cut in on this section. Careful not to damage this line here, that's absolutely critical that we don't cut down into that section. And we want to go beyond this outside line here. But that doesn't need sawing, that can just be hacked off with a chisel. So we take the beef of that out. Just pair this off using a sharp chisel. Again, don't cut past that moulding line there. When we get close to it, just take a bit less material off with each pass. And when we're left with the, the tiniest of steps, it's just a case of resting the chisel on keeping it nice and square and we're taking that last little bit off just polishing that shoulder with that sharp sharp cut that should be a perfect fit for our shoulders on our tenon so if we replace the tenon you'll see that we're still not got a joint that will go together we need to do the counterpart scribe into this section here. So now that we've taken that material off to that distance there, we can transfer that mark over to here. And that's how deep we need to go with our scribe into this piece. So the jig will come in handy again. Right now, we're looking to use that 45 degree reference face. We're gonna cut from this exact point on this shoulder 45 degrees back. I always go just slightly less than the point of the shoulder, we're talking a quarter of a millimetre. 
The reason for that is to give myself some tolerance on the scribe, so if we go a bit too much, there's nothing really you can do, you've, you've cut too much material away. If you just go a bit less and you scribe it with a bit of a, a back cut, that scribe can actually compress into the base and you'll get a really tight fit. Then it's just a case of using that line that's cast by the 45 degree mitre here. So we're following on that edge. And we're going to chop that material back to this point here on that rail. This is quite tricky with the camera in the way. I will try my best. If we actually angle on the final cut the chisel very slightly in so it cuts down, you'll see that that helps the, the joint create a little bevel and reduce the chance of any of the, the back of the material fouling the moulding and stopping it going together. Gosh, my eyes are getting worse I reckon. you've got your eye in with this it doesn't actually take a particularly long time to do each cut you might think on your first one you've got for the hours of work ahead of you but once you get in the swing of it it's not too bad just got to be really careful the longer the molding is in this direction and shallower it is the harder it is because you get a really really feather edge piece left on here so this is quite a, a long flat section just here and it's going to be quite difficult to describe this last little bit without breaking it off so we've just got to go in microscopic cuts and we're just take, literally taking the fibres off just very slowly one bit at a time until we get to that final cut this is a tiny detail I can barely see it but that's the that's where it all pays dividends in the final job is when every little bit just looks perfect. Come on, don't snap on me. There we go. Wonderful. I just want a small chisel to get the last of it. If we take it out, we can give it a test fit on the actual mortise position it's going in. When we push it together, we want to do it on the joint where it's actually going. So if there's any sort of tension in it and it's going to dent the timbers, it's specific to that joint that's going together. So we slightly, slightly shallow cut this so that it will make a slight dent in this timber in the style you can see there there is a, a bit of a an impact mark we don't want anything serious just 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 a mark in that but you want to push them together for the first time in the specific joint where they're actually going so see that's a pretty good fit we just got to do that for the remaining however many joints on the door so there's four per panel but yeah what's that six 24 joints I actually made a mistake earlier when I was showing you how I cut the wedge room section out. I measured the 24mm it was from the haunch to the edge of the piece of timber on the stiles. And then I measured it off the end of the tenon, that's wrong. I just realised I've done it, getting a bit carried away with filming. But you want to go, whatever that measurement was, from the deepest shoulder, so the one that you've measured from. 
Then you can set your little gauge up for that measurement. These are dead good, these are. You can fine adjust using this thread here. Fine adjust the measurement real nicely. Lock it off and you get a perfect flat cut on this back edge. So that's the, the cut that we want to make. And then we can just put that line in on that tenon to make up that cut line. Nice and sharp, it's the perfect line to lodge a chisel into. And we can measure our tenon through tenon. And that's what we're removing. Remember it's away from the edge, so this is the edge where the mould and the groove is. We want to remove it off that back edge. Next I'm just going to take these intermediate rails, clean the bottom of the mortise out where we've done a stub mortise. Just make sure they're nice and square bottomed from the mortise chisel. It leaves a bit of a fleck in the corner where the drill bit doesn't quite hit the bottom of the mortise chisel. And I'm just going to mark the tenons here. So I've numbered them on where I want them to be on the door and I'm going to fit each joint into the corresponding numbered tenon and mortise. So I'm just going to mark on the square edge there on the back the depth of that tenon. You can of course measure it with a ruler. So we're looking about 29 mil there. And I'm just going to mark 29 mil from the shoulder onto the tenon there and then cut that off. If you've done a, a pencil line to measure from, you're measuring from the end of the tenon there to that pencil line. And then you're taking that measurement and measuring from there, the shoulder to the end of that 29mm. We'll cut that off and then we can do the same cut on here. So we can mark where we've chiselled to, there and there. Remove this piece of material and that joint should go together. I'll do that for all the intermediate rails and all the muntins. So this is the muntin joint and it's the same process for the intermediate rail where it goes into the style. When we've been chiselling in the end of this joint, if you can see that, it's really difficult to chisel the profile past this tenon here. We can just take that bit off the long grain, so in the mortise side, rather than taking it off on the tenon. So it's basically no further than the extremes of the timber, so if you've marked them on at 10 mil past that mortise, you don't want to go any further than that. But it's basically a cut like this to ease them bits, and it's well back past from the areas in which you see and that joint should slip together with a little tap it should go up nicely and after all that hard work working each individual joint feckling them getting them to fit right finally at the stage where we can assemble it all together and see whether our measurements have been right and whether it all fits together as a one piece in a door so i've laid it out flat on a bench it's the easiest way to assemble a frame like this where you've got muntins and rails etc you can stand it upright in a vice but you you start putting pieces in, you need to wedge them together and, and manipulate them a bit too much to get them together. So just lay them all nice and flat so nothing can fall or drop away from, from each other and then just start assembling it, starting from the inside out. So put the muntins into the rails. You should have nice fitting joints. Just a push fit. And then we can slide the rails into these styles. So start one end but don't drive it fully home. Just get them all started. Like that and we can lift it up. Good. And again, start in one end, just start it in the tenon and be very careful putting this side on. You just want to get each bit started a little bit because if you try and hammer that one while well, this one's not quite located, you're going to end up damaging the moulding. So just take it slowly and uh, have a bit of patience. 
work each one in series until they're all in their mortises and we can start to tap it down to the home position. There we go, looking good. Doesn't even need clamps that, that looks beautiful. Perfect. So it's got nice tight joints on this side. We turn it over, we're looking for the same thing on the other side, which we've got once we've clamped her up. That's beautiful, that is perfect. So what we're looking for, the main concern really is, is from the setting out, is the length of these muntings. These, these joints here are very much dependent on getting them cut lengths and the tenon lengths absolutely spot on. If you're a millimetre out on them, and there's three of them, that's three mil over the length of the door, you're either not going to be able to get your top and bottom rail in because they're going to be too long, or you're going to have gaps, so that's quite critical. There is, you can tweak it a little bit. If you have gone a bit short with them, you can just tweak the tenons in here and a tiny bit on the top and bottom rail each. Just bring them in a touch just to tighten these joints up, but the ideal is what you want is when it's sort of dry fitted together like that and not clamped, it's that the tenon on the end here, so that the top and the bottom rail is just slightly away from this inside line. So you want it to have a bit of clamping action with the wedging of the joint. So when we put this wedge in, you just want that tenon just to sneak up to that line and put a bit of pressure all through these munting rails in the door. If that's tight up to the line and there's a slight gap in this joint, we're just gonna have to trim a tiny bit off the mortise just to let that rail clamp the pressure into this joint here. When we're wedging up the door, you, you start on the ends to wedge the two rails together, top and bottom. So you're putting these four outside wedges in first. That acts as a clamp on the whole door, but you're also working your, your middle wedges in the intermediate rails to suit the joints on the door. So you're, you're sort of clamping everything into the middle of the door. So we can give ourselves a pat on the back now for getting the door together that fits and all the joints are nice and it's the right size. So well done for getting this far if you are having a go at this yourself. Next job is to work on the panels. I've got to glue some bits together. So I'm going to start work on the panels and then waiting for glue to dry and, and stains and stuff in the interim. I'm going to come back and start working a bit on the door. So I'm going to perhaps put a finish or, or sand and dye or spirit stain these mouldings before it goes together so that I can get a, a nice finish on them rather than trying to do it when it's in the door and struggling to get in the corners. So start cleaning up the panels and then come back to the door in the interim periods. So this is the panel material. The plan here is to just plane it and edge it on one side each way so we get a nice flat surface. I'm going to run it through the bandsaw, split it down basically down the middle need about 22 mil and we've got plenty of timber here so we'll split it down the middle we'll then plane that split edge so the, the band sword cut I'm going to plane as my two flat surfaces and then thickness it down to that point I'm basically going to open it up like a book on that cut line so use them two edges fold them back on themselves and then when you glue them together that'll create a nice book matched uh, grain pattern from that single piece of wood so I've got four of them to do and then the other panel, like I said before, I've managed to get out a solid piece, so we don't need to glue that one together, that'll just be a one piece panel. There we go, sports fans. That's the original piece of wood, opened up and jointed perfectly straight and square along these two edges, and we'll glue them together. I'm just taking the height of the panels, the visible height of the panels. You want to add roughly 10 mil onto each side. So we've got 450 mil tall panels, so 
gonna try and get rid of most of this staining in here. That's why I've chosen to joint it together in this direction rather than have it joining in the middle and make a feature of it. I'm just gonna set out the 450 mil plus my two tenths. So 470 mil is my minimum I need for my panel. And then we've got a raised field on it, so something like this. And that's 40 mil from where you see it on that sight line to this field edge here. So what we need to do is allow that 40 mil in from each edge, which with the 10 mil that sits in the groove is roughly 50 mil. So it's 470, so that'd be 420. And they're the points at which we can't do any dominoing beyond. So if we put a domino, imagine that's the end grain cut of the panel across here. And if we put a domino in that section there, there's a potential for it to show through and be seen on the panel. So just want to set it out before we do any dominoing where we know we're going to be machining on the panel. I've got a glue joint cutter that puts a glue joint block in it like that. I wouldn't use that on a raised and field panel because it, where you've got that combing effect of the cutters joining like this, if you run the raised moulding of the panel through it, it can actually show like a long glue line and also a staggered glue line. So where you see then two boards join there with a the glue line, when you get down to the panel where you cut away, the glue line might be slightly offset by a couple of mil and it just, just doesn't look right. It looks, looks a bit crap really. So if you're gluing raised and field panels together, I would always just butt glue them together and stick a couple of either biscuit type joints or dominoes or something like that in it, but keep them away from this raised field area. So I'll keep one quite tight to that, so I'll keep 20 mil away from that line there. We'll do a domino, 20 mil away from that one. Then we'll perhaps put two more in it. So about 300, 10, 20. About 110 mil. These are gonna be finished 22 mil, so I'm gonna use an eight mil domino. All the panels are the same size, so I can use one of these as my pattern piece. I just take one leaf of each pair, line that up where I want it to sit on that board so that I know that I've removed any imperfections and just mark them across the same. And then do that as a pair. Again, I can adjust this one against that one to remove any imperfections. Make absolutely sure that before you cut these off to length or plane them flat, so I've only planed one side of this. One side's got the edge I surfaced to do the band sawing. One side's still rough sawn. Once this is glued together, I'm gonna to run them again over the surface planer because it will fit on my surface planer. It's not too wide. So they're slightly full of thickness to allow me to do that. Don't plane them before you've cut them to pretty much finish length or finish length because you'll lose these markings that you've put on here for where your dominoes are. And then you're sort of cutting blind and you've got a potential risk to machine into them domino holes. Right, raised and field panels. So we're looking for a finish like this. We've got a parallel groove cut into the timber. So we need a parallel section on the actual panel itself. If you buy a proper panel raising cutter, they'll come with a cutter section and then a flat section built into the cutter. So you'd mold it flat on the bed like that and the disc will cut away at it like this and leave this nice profile that slots into your groove. I haven't got a panel raising cutter. I could probably count on one hand the number of doors that I've made with raised panels. So it's not really been something I've needed to invest in. So what I tend to do is use a cutter to create this tolerance gap here between these two. So it's a nice fit in the groove. And that cutter's got just a slight radius on it. 
it sort of kickstarts the bevel so that when I run my bevel cutter in, it can run in line with that little radius that's left. You get sort of a nice transition between the two without sort of a hard edge or a groove. So on a fresh piece of timber, I recommend you get a few pattern pieces out if you're going to be doing this because you're going to be doing a bit of trial and error to get the fit right. In effect, we're going to be cutting a bit like this for a start. It's going to look something like that. And then turn the piece vertically so it'll be in this position on the spindle molder. Then I've just got a 40mm flat cutter that I'd sharpen up, absolutely razor sharp, and we'll take this flat bevel out here at just a very slight angle and leave a step in it there. So here's the cutter, hopefully my cast iron ring will fit really tight to that, and I've not got to put a false bed on. Yeah, it just fits in there nicely. So we only need to go about 10mm uh, tall to this section, so we should just get away with that. I'm going to go roughly to that pencil line, so it's a bit high at the minute. Raise it up just above where we want it to finish. I'm going to put a false fence on. I'll have the cutter slightly higher than I'm actually going to use it to wind the fence back, and then just drop it down a touch, and then it's not going to rub constantly while I'm using it. You want really, really accurate cuts with this. You want perfectly square panels, and everything to run through absolutely perfectly. You don't want anything pulling away from the fences or or not being perfectly flat on the bed. It's got to be got to be really accurate. I put a two mil panel gap around the whole panel, so that's one mil each side. So it's about nine mil until the start of the bevel. This wants to be a good sort of interference fit into the groove of these styles. So we're after about the 12mm fit, the 15.8, we'll wind it up uh, 3 and 3.8mm. looks just a touch loose to me. It's a good fit but by the time I've sanded that it's going to be a bit loose so I've just knocked the spindle down 0.1 of a mil and I'm going to run it through with the wheels driving it through so it's full pressure down on the bed and that should give me a good indication of how the fit is. You want to try a test piece in a few different pieces of your door just to check you know there's going to be a slight variation in thickness no matter how good or sharp your cutters are throughout the door so just try it in a few different bits if it's really really tight you've got to take a touch more off them Okay, so I'd say that's about perfect. It's too tight as it is. Like I say, when we've sanded the back of that, I've also been attacking this a bit with the sandpaper and a bit of finishing. It's gonna reduce in thickness. If it's still tight after you've sanded it, it's just an adjustment fit, really, with an orbital sander. You take a touch more off and you'll be surprised how quickly it goes. It removes some material and it goes loose. So I'd say just tight like that. It's, it's just perfect before sanding. So now we can run all the panels through at that setting, like I say, making sure you've got that 9mm of flat before you start to bring this bevel in. When we're going to run the panels through, I've dimensioned these on the panel saw, they're absolutely perfectly thicknessed all the way across, so it's exactly the same all the way around. That's dead important that they are the same thickness if you're running it through in this direction, so you're machining on the underside. If you've got a bit of variation in your, your thickness, uh, you're going to have to machine from the top and have the material pass under the cutter on the spindle so that you've got a, a nominal thickness between the bed and the cutter that's creating that panel gap. Otherwise you're going to get varying results in the fit of your panel. So I'm lucky I've got some good equipment, sharp blades and um, an accurate thickness board so I can machine it this way around. 
don't know if I mentioned just then or not, I've, I've forgotten them. Just take all the sharp edges off of your panel so that you've got no like nicks left from where the saws cut it, any sawdust or anything, because that's going to affect the fit as well. These have got to be absolutely perfect when they run through the machine. Okay, so I've just knocked the door style off and popped that first panel in the actual opening that it's going to go in. The fit is absolutely perfect, so it's a bit tight, but like I say, sanding it will help ease that in, especially on that back edge where we're going to sand the whole surface. So I know I'm, I'm confident I can run all the panels through now at that setting and have a good fit. It's really important that when you're dimensioning your panels that they are spot on square and they are the same gap both in the width and in the height so that this mitre point where the two mouldings intersect on the corners runs into the corner of the moulding there. If you've allowed 5mm in the width and only 3mm in the height you'll see that mitre that where it intersects just run off very slightly so it's important that you, you dimension your panels spot on square. We machine the end grain first with the backing piece. This is to stop the breakout as you machine the end grain. The backing piece will help prevent any tear out just on that last little edge. When you go to run it through the long ways along with the grain, it stops the panel just sitting off the fence, that, that last little millimetre of where the, the grain sort of tends to rip out if you don't have a backing piece. So if you run it through and it just sits away from the fence, again in them corners where it meets the moulding, it's going to look slightly different as it mitres around that corner. It's not going to intersect dead, dead in the corner. So it's all about keeping that cut edge of your panel dead tight to the fence. Once you've moulded the long grain, you can't really, unless you go deeper, cut the end grain. So if you accidentally run the long grain in first, you're going to get a bit of breakout on the end grain cut. So really pay attention and make sure that you cut the end grain one first. And for the final cut on the panel, it's a 40mm HSS cutter that I've sharpened up to death, so this is this is polished sharp. It'll shave the hair on your face, it's that sharp. It needs to be because we're, we're cutting into the timber like this, and across the end grain there, that cut's really going to show up, so it needs to, be, needs to be dead sharp. I've just took like a little 10 degree bevel off the end there for about 1 or 2 mil and that will just engage nicely in with that slight radius as it starts into this flat panel gap so we should get a pretty seamless raise from the parallel cut here to a bevel and that will just stop with a fielded step there on the panel. So I'm just going to set a rough height that we're going to work to. I've got to put a bevel on the cutter because it's just a flat, it's almost like a rebate to that cutter. From my sample piece, I know it's about 9 or 10 degrees, so we'll start at 9. We'll just raise it up roughly where we're going to need it, somewhere there. I'm going to clamp a backing board, so pretty substantial, so three quarter ply in this case. I can get the fences a bit closer. I'm going to clamp that above the cutter, so somewhere here. Just raise it 5mm off that cutter height. Got to clamp it out the way of the panel, so I might need to screw it in fact just to keep it out the way. So I've got some holes in the beds, I can turn these around so that hole is higher up, and I'll screw this backing panel to these fences so there's no clamps in the way. The reason for that is when your panel's running through like this vertically, the clamps are going to interfere with it. So I'm just going to set a rough depth. So it's just slightly away from that bottom cut there. I'm going to use an actual panel using the end grain first, holding it dead flat against this surface. You can't let it dip in away from that. So it's really important you keep it flat on that surface and just run them through by hand. I have got a little tool that will help press the panel against that surface. It just applies pressure through a sprung wheel and that's uh, quite handy in situations like this. don't want too much pressure on this tool because as you feed that panel in and there's nothing behind it just on that section there you don't want it to dive in like that.
I'm not happy with this slight bevel on the fielding here on the panel, so I'm just going to set up a variable angle cutter about 60 degrees just to take that off, just so it looks a little less sharp and a bit more pleasing to the eye.